Hi, my name is Sarah Bryce, and for my nutritional biochemistry final exam, I will be explaining the metabolic pathways of carbohydrates, amino acids, and fatty acids in the liver cells during a fed state. So, getting started with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are broken down into glucose. Glucose is then a um, transported to the liver where it enters the hepatocytes through tra a transporter called GLUT2. Um, once it enters the liver cell, it's immediately phosphorylated by glucokinase. Anytime there is a kinase, that means something is going to become phosphorylated, and that is an irreversible step. Um, once the glucose is phosphorylated, it becomes glucose 6 phosphate. Um, and there are three pathways that glucose 6-phosphate can take. It can go continue down the glycolysis pathway, it can go to glycogenesis, the storage form, or the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, I'll start by explaining the glycolysis pathway. So glucose 6-phosphate turns to is um, converted to fructose 6-phosphate through um, phosphoglucose isomerase. And then, this is an important step, after um, it is converted to fructose 6-phosphate, phosphofructokinase 1, which is the chief rate-limiting enzyme, converts fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And this, of course, because it's a kinase, it's phosphorylated, and it is very um, important and irreversible. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphate has two paths to choose from. It can either turn into dihydroxyacetone phosphate, or it can become glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Um, if it becomes glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, then it can continue metabolizing until it is turned into pyruvate. Um, what happens is it is turned into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate to phosphoenopyruvate, and then pyruvate kinase, again with the kinase, it is turned into pyruvate. Um, and this, of course, is where glycolysis leads to the citric acid cycle, because pyruvate is the precursor to acetyl-CoA. Um, so acetyl-CoA is the starting point for the citric acid cycle. But before I get started explaining the citric acid cycle, um, I'm going to allude to what Dr. Walsh taught us, and that it is more of a traffic circle and less of a cycle. Um, a chemical isn't necessarily entering at one point and going through the entire process. It may come in and then leave at an intermediate, or it com may come in as an intermediate and continue the cycle. It can come in, basically come in at any point and leave at any point. But um, I'll be explaining the cycle um, step by step, but I just wanted to acknowledge that a chemical won't necessarily take the entire um, won't go through the entire process. But before I confuse myself, um, there is a acronym, a very helpful acronym that Dr. Walsh taught us that has saved my life in biochemistry. Um, it is, can I keep selling sex for money officer? Um, and the acronyms, each one represents a part of the citric acid cycle. So back to where I start, was back to what I was saying. Acetyl CoA converts to citrate, um, which is a six carbon molecule, and then via aconitase, it is turned converted to isocitrate. This is an iron dependent step. Therefore, this is where iron in the diet comes into play. Um, can I keep so isocitrate is then converted to alpha ketoglutarate, 
via isocitrate dehydrogenase. Um, Alpha-ketoglutarate is then converted to succinyl-CoA via alpha-glutarate dehydrogenase complex. Um, so it alpha-ketoglutarate uses alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex and is converted to succinyl-CoA. Succinyl-CoA then uses succinyl-CoA synthase to convert to succinate. Can I keep selling sex for... Okay, then succinate uses succinate dehydrogenase to turn to fumarate. Fumarate uses fumarase to turn to malate. Malate uses malate dehydrogenase to turn to oxaloacetate. Um, so I'm going to pause for a second. Citrate is a six carbon molecule. Once it, once it cycles through the citric acid cycle one time, it is converted, it loses two carbons because oxaloacetate is a four carbon molecule. Um, so that's just something important to notice that it is losing carbons throughout this process. And, um, okay, so glycolysis leads to the citric acid cycle, which leads to the electron transport chain. This is where the bulk of ATP production occurs. Um, so ions, byproduct ions from the citric acid cycle are then used in the electron transport chain and they jump from complex to complex in the wall of the mitochondria and they produce ATP because from complex to complex they are grabbing electrons. So um, I'm going to back up a little bit because I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that glycolysis is all occurring in the cytosol of the hepatocyte. And then it turns, once glycolysis breaks down glucose 6-phosphate into pyruvate, the pyruvate then enters the mitochondria, and that is where the citric acid cycle takes place. And then the electrons from the citric acid cycle are then used in the electron transport chain, which is the wall separating the intramembranous space from the intramitochondrial matrix. So I'm going to explain the electron transport chain. So there are four complexes and some enzymes in the electron transport chain that the ions jump from one to the next. So it starts with complex one which is a protein embedded in the mitochondrial wall in the mito separating the intr intramembranous space from the intramitochondrial mito matrix. So it starts at complex 1. The electrons go to complex 2, to enzyme CoQ, to complex 3, to cytosol 3, I mean, I'm sorry, cytos cytosol C, then to complex 4. And then this is where... Um, it go, the electrons go from cytosol-4 to ATP synthase. This is, some consider it to be the fifth complex. Whether it is or not, it's debatable. It's besides the point. But um, ATC, ATP synthase is where the bulk of the ATP production occurs. Um, one Complete oxidation of one glucose yields roughly 32 to 34 ATPs which is significant because in glycolysis roughly two ATPs are produced and in the citric acid cycle I believe it's three ATPs are produced. So there's no question about where the bulk of ATPs are manufactured by the mitochondria. So, um, And something else I wanted to mention is that the electron transport chain results in a superoxide radical. Um, which of course our body does not want this superoxide radical. So it what it does is it uses an enzyme called superoxide dismutase to convert it to H2O2, which then oh, and this is a zinc, copper, and manganese dependent step. Um and then the H2O2 grabs two hydrogen ions to convert it to water so it can eliminate the superoxide radical. Um, 
And that's all I really wanted to say for the electron transport chain. Um, and I just wanted to mention the regulating um, mechanisms of glycolysis. Um, so basically, um, phosphofructokinase 1 is the rate limiting enzyme. If there are other molecules present, they can be used to allosterically inhibit phosphofructokinase 1. So an example of this is if there is an excess of fructose 6-phosphate, it spills over into a molecule called fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And a surplus of this um, inhibits fructose or phosphofructose kinase 1. If pho phosphofructokinase 1 is inhibited, then the whole glycolysis process is inhibited as well. Um, another example of this, um, something that regulates phosphofructokinase 1 is citrate. If citrate is built up in the mitochondria, then it gets pushed out into the cytosol, um, which also inhibits phosphofructokinase 1. And if phosphofructokinase 1 is inhibited, it leads to an, a surplus of glucose 6-phosphate. Um, and like I said before, glucose 6-phosphate has three paths to choose from. It can go through glycolysis, glycogenesis, or the pentose phosphate pathway. And phosphofruct so if there is inhibited phosphofructokinase 1, then the glycolysis pathway is drastically show slowed or even shut off. So then the glucose 6-phosphate can either go down the pentose phosphate pathway or it can go to glycogenesis, go through glycogenesis. Um, briefly touching on the pentose phosphate pathway, um, all I really wanted to mention was that the pentose phosphate pathway is dependent on, it has a chief rate limiting enzyme called transketolase. And transketolase is a thiamine dependent enzyme. Therefore, if there is not if there isn't enough thiamine present in the diet, then transketolase um, inhibits the pentose phosphate pathway. That's all I really wanted to say about that. Um, another fate of glucose six phosphate is glycogenesis. Um, this is where glucose is stored via glycogen. So basically, in summary, what happens is glucose 6-phosphate is converted to glucose 1-phosphate, where the phosphate group is moved, so that um, a glycogen primer can collect the um, glycogen molecules and store them. In summary, sorry, that's pretty, um, <laughs> a dilute, a very diluted version, but, um, I just basically, I wanted to spend more time touching on glycolysis to citric acid cycle to electron transport chain, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned that glucose 6-phosphate, which is the active form of glucose, has three fates to choose from, and that the bulk of ATP is produced from the electron transport chain, and I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned that citrate and fructose 2,6-bisphosphate are inhibitors of glycolysis. Um, so that's really all that I wanted to talk about. I am going to continue in another video discussing um, amino acid and fatty acid metabolism in the hepatocytes.